Hello AP Chemistry students. We're now at section 1.8 on valence electrons and ionic compounds. And this is actually going to be the last section of the unit. So our learning objective here is to explain the relationship between trends in the reactivity of elements and periodicity. So we're going to be leaning on a lot of the concepts that we learned in the last few slideshows. So valence electrons, as we know, are the most outer shell electrons. Um, and they're the most important when it comes to bonding, because when a chemical bond occurs, electrons are being transferred or shared between two elements. So that means that the electrons in the outermost part of the electron cloud are the ones that are going to be most likely to do that. And some atoms are highly electronegative, meaning they want to pull electrons towards them. And others have low ionization energy, which means they're easy to remove electrons from. So there is sort of a, a synergy here where atoms that have high electronegativity and ones that have low ionization energy have a tendency to react and bond. And this is the foundation of what we call an ionic bond. So in the example below, we have sodium, which is a metal with low ionization energy. Um, it has one electron in its valence shell. And then chlorine, which is a nonmetal with high electronegativity, which is uh, missing one electron in its outer shell. That means there's going to be a tendency for the electron from sodium, represented by the pink dot here, to be pulled away from sodium and join the outer shell of chlorine. And this is something that happens very often between metals and nonmetals because of that relationship between highly electronegative and low ionization energy. This is also driven by the fact that electrons or uh, atoms can get more stable once they have full valence shells. So the sodium only had one valence electron. And for the sodium, at least in the case of the third period, uh, they're going to get a full valence shell by getting eight. So sodium would have to gain seven to achieve this, which is unlikely to happen. So it's more likely for it to lose one so that the shell below is now full with eight. And the chlorine, since it has seven valence electrons, only needs one to get a full shell. So it's going to be uh, highly likely to pull an electron towards it. And this uh, this ionic bond is further strengthened by the fact that the sodium becomes a cation, it loses one electron, so it becomes positive, and the chlorine becomes an anion, and it gains one electron to be negative. So then there's also a sort of electrostatic coulombic attraction between the, the positive sodium and the negative chlorine. And you can see that um, they're going to get a noble gas configuration once they become uh, uh, full, full valence shells. So the sodium here, the Bohr model looks almost identical to the one for neon. And the chlorine one, um, I don't have it up here, but it would look identical to the one for argon. And we both know that neon and argon aren't reactive, so they're already stable in the form that they're in. So it becomes sort of like a, a benchmark of stability for other elements. Now, the ratio in which these elements combine to make ionic compounds is going to be based off of how many electrons they have in their valence shell and how many they need to get a full valence shell. So if you consider the example below where we have magnesium and chlorine, well, magnesium, unlike sodium, has two valence electrons. So you'd either have to gain six or lose two, and it's way more likely to lose two. So the sodium, or sorry, the, the magnesium is going to give up two electrons which means that since chlorine can only gain one, it's going to have to interact with two different chlorine atoms in order to give up both of its electrons. So then one electron goes from this magnesium to this chlorine, one goes from this magnesium to this chlorine. Now both of the chlorines have full shells, and now the magnesium has gotten rid of its two outer shells, so then the shell below becomes the full shell. And then we write the formula unit for it depending on the ratio of the elements. So we needed two chlorines, for every one magnesium, so we end up with a compound MgCl2, and we call that magnesium chloride. Um, I'm not going to be testing you on the names, but I would like you to be able to recognize them and name them, at least for ease of uh, communication on these things. So uh, with an ionic compound, we usually say the cation name just as it is, so like magnesium or sodium, and then for the anion name, um, we kind of remove the last few letters of the word and change it to "-ide", so chlorine becomes chloride. Nitrogen would become nitride. Oxygen would become oxide. Fluorine become fluoride, etc. And also we find out that elements in a group tend to react similarly because of that similar number of valence electrons. We kind of uh, talked about that in terms of periodic trends and things within a group and family having similar chemical properties. Um, so we can see here that all of the alkali metals are going to form 
compounds with oxygen in the same ratio of two to one because they all have one valence electron to give up and oxygen has six valence electrons and it needs two. So it's gonna to need to gain an electron from two of the alkali metals. So they're all gonna combine in the same ratio regardless of the, the element in the group. Um, so their chemical properties end up becoming really similar as a result. Um, even though this isn't a um, reaction for a uh, ionic uh, bond, we can see here that if X represents an alkali metal, um, it can react with water to make uh, an alkali metal hydroxide and hydrogen gas. And um, this is gonna be the same for all of the alkali metals. You could substitute this X with any of the alkali metals and you'll get a similar effect. And if you pause this video now and watch this YouTube video, you can see all of the alkali metals reacting with water. And one of the things you will have noticed from that video is as you go down the group, um, the reaction becomes more and more violent. And that has to do with the fact that the ionization energy gets less and less as you go down, so it becomes easier and easier to react. So the things that are reacting with it don't need to basically put as much effort in. The reaction just kind of happens easily. Um, whoops. And this is kind of the opposite for the halogens on the other side of the periodic table. We know that um, for fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, as we go down the group, the electronegativity is, is going to decrease because the, the, the size of the atoms gets bigger and bigger. And we know that electronegativity is sort of tied to um, the size of the atom. And the further away the nucleus is from possible electrons that might be added to the, the outer shell, the, the less likely it is to happen. So if you watch the video below, you'll also get to see all of the halogens reacting and you'll see that the fluorine and the chlorine react like almost instantly, but the bromine and the iodine are kind of a, a more long drawn out process of a reaction. All right, so overall, the reactivity of an element and the ratios in which it combines with other elements is based off of the number of valence electrons. And there are also trends with the number of valence electrons based off of the position on the periodic table and kind of how close they are to getting a full shell. So we talked about in the examples of like the alkali metals like sodium and the alkaline earth metals like magnesium that they're going to have a tendency to lose electrons because it's easier to lose one or two than it is to gain six or seven. Um, so the elements on the left side of the periodic table with their low ionization energies are going to have a, a higher tendency to give up electrons to have a full outer shell kind of beneath. And the things on the right side of the periodic table, the ones that are only like one, two, or three electrons away from getting a full shell are going to have a tendency to gain electrons. So the ones that lose electrons become positive. So the alkali metals become plus one. The alkaline earth metals become plus two. The halogens become minus one. Uh, oxygen and the similar elements become minus two. And nitrogen and similar elements become minus three. Um, oh, I also forgot to mention boron and aluminum, which make plus three ions. Now, uh, the carbon group, carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, lead, um, uh, with the exception of lead and tin, these other three don't really make uh, ions because if you think about a four plus or a four minus ion, both of them are kind of equally unlikely. It's, it's kind of rare that you're gonna have an ion that's formed with four electrons being gained or lost. Um, so these elements tend to form more covalent bonds but we'll talk about that in the next unit. Um, but based off of the periodic table, we can generally predict what value the charge is gonna be for an ion based off of its position and how many electrons it's gonna gain or lose to get that full shell. Um, and the transition metals, in terms of this trend, um, it's a lot more complicated. I showed examples of that with the iron two plus and the iron three plus being more related to the sort of subshell interactions. Um, so those are much, much harder to predict the charges of, and you're not gonna be super held accountable for that. So just know that the transition metals are harder to predict because they can form different types of ions. Um, also, I mentioned this earlier, but with the, the carbon elements, they form covalent bonds, meaning they're sharing electrons rather than taking them, but they at least still form in a predictable pattern. We know that carbon having four valence electrons is would either need to gain four or lose four to get that full shell. So it's gonna sort of share four. So carbon is gonna have like a, a one to four ratio with things that have one electron. Um, 
or like a one to two ratio with things that you know gain two electrons, like sulfur, for example. All right. Um, so if you're going to try to figure out what an ionic compound's uh, formula is, first you consider what kind of ion they're going to become if they're going to uh, lose electrons or gain electrons. And let's do an example. So say aluminum sulfide. This is going to be an ionic compound formed between aluminum and sulfur. We know based off, based off its position on the periodic table that aluminum is going to form a 3 plus ion and sulfur is going to form a 2 minus ion. So 3 plus and 2 minus are going to attract each other, but they're not going to attract each other one to one because if 3 plus and 2 minus joined up, you'd still have 1 plus left over. And sort of the goal of making an ionic compound is to make one where the charge is neutral. So we need to find the lowest common ratio of these two things. So for two and three, the uh, lowest common multiple is going to be six. So that means that if we have two aluminums, we're going to have two times three to make six plus, and then three sulfurs, we're going to have three times two minus to make six minus, then the six plus and the six minus are going to cancel each other out. So that means that the formula unit for this compound is going to be Al2S3. There's also a quick trick that can help you predict the formula of ionic compounds using the charges. Um, if you take the charges, uh, say you take the ion, uh, the anion charge, and then you bring it down and make it the subscript of the cation, and do the same thing with the cation, you bring the cation charge down and make it the subscript of the anion, you'll generally get the same effect. However, just be please be aware that if the the ratio isn't already at its like you know lowest whole number ratio, it's not going to work. For example, if I have calcium two plus and sulfur two minus, if I was to bring both of those charges down, I'd end up with Ca two S two, and that's an improper formula unit for an ionic compound because it's not its lowest whole number ratio. So we'd have, actually have to make it CaS instead. Um, another good example of that is uh, lead sulfide. If we have four plus and two minus, you might expect it to be Pb two S four. But formula units are always based off of the lowest whole number ratio. Remember, this isn't true for like complex molecules that are um, covalent. This is mainly true for ionic formula unit things. So here we would have to reduce that to PBS2 to make it accurate. And that is all on this topic. And I'll see you in the next unit.